现在非常开心的要呃欢迎呃就是亚洲地区两位总编辑跟一位时尚总监跟我们一起做这个呃论坛。Um, welcome and thank you、um, to all of you. It's great to see familiar faces. I would love to introduce all of you to our audience. First of all,、um, Singapore Vogue Singapore's editor in chief Norman Tan. Hi, Leslie. Thank you so much for having me. And、uh, Vogue Thailand's editor in chief. Kula Wit La Suksui, is that right? <laughs> yes, right. Hello, everyone. And finally, fashion director for Vogue Japan, Sari Masuda. Hi, everyone. Hello. Thank you so much for joining us. I think we're just going to have a, a casual or maybe semi-casual conversation about、um, the fashion industry and emerging designers in your respective territories. So,、um, why do why don't I kickstart、um, and share a little bit about what's going on in Taiwan with everyone? All right, let's enter into our first slide, please. So I think that、um, well the slides are are in Chinese, but I'll I'll、um, speak in English on everyone's behalf.、Um, I really want to start by saying that Taiwan's competitive advantage is our textile innovation and manufacturing, and we're very well known for、um, our high tech and high performance fabrics,、um, including those that are fireproof.、Um, And also those that have become、um, very important COVID protective gear,、um, you know, which sort of reflects our times right now.、Um, we're also very innovative with sustainable fabrics, and I think that this sort of、um, manufacturing industry、uh, that really focuses on innovations like these are.、Uh, Really, a great offering for our designers, for our fashion designers, for experimentation. Next slide. So,、uh, in 2018, our Ministry of Culture initiated the inaugural edition of Taipei Fashion Week, which Vogue assisted as a major partner throughout the years. And for Taipei Fashion Week, there are really two main objectives that we're rigorously pushing forward. One is The nurturing of emerging designers, and two is、uh, the promoting of sustainable practices. Next slide.、Um, and first, I really want to talk about this sort of new initiative、uh, that happened last March. So, our Ministry of Culture went hand in hand with the Ministry of Education to provide a platform for outstanding student designers during Taipei Fashion Week. I mean, this ongoing initiative invited students from four prominent design schools in Taiwan to enter a competition, and offering shortlisted candidates a chance to showcase their work on the runway. And in fact, long before Taipei Fashion Week in 2005, the Ministry of Education has already initiated a few platforms to nurture student designers. Locally and internationally, and、um, what you're seeing on screen, these photos, they're actually、um, photo shoots that Vogue has done,、uh, Vogue Taiwan, for these student designers that came out in our April issue,、um, and it's a full feature with the works of、um, these outstanding students from four universities. So just so you can see, there really is a variety of、um, of textile usage, of volume,、um, of patterns and layering, etc., and you know influences from from a lot of、uh, diverse sources. So I think that this initiative is really pushing forward、um, this the, you know the the、uh, the creativity. For our student designers to, to know that they actually have a great platform to be seen, and I think it's also this this kind of work is really important for us at Vogue to also be pushing our talents forward. So, following that, I I, I want to also highlight three Taiwanese designers that are pushing the agenda for sustainability and innovation.、Um, the first brand I like to highlight is Storywear. Um, and this brand is not only sustainable in practice but also in principle.、Um, so all of the materials they use are upcycled denim, and the designer Quan's business provides re-employment re for displaced women 
and mothers of children with disabilities. So um, waste re reduction is only one component of our business, but really, you know, maintaining a, a sustainable economy is their contribution to social responsibility. And the thing with their collection is that, you know, she's, it's not really big on silhouettes, but really practical everyday wear that's 100% handmade with recycled materials, as you can see on the images. And the second designer I want to highlight is, uh, or the second brand, um, is Oak Leak. And they really are an advocate of Taiwan's innovative high-tech high -tech textiles. They, they're known for their functional urban wear with a fashionable edge and has become frequent participants at PT Uomo in Italy and New York Fashion Week. So they, I think that, you know, they've really sort of taken this, uh, the Taiwanese textile industry along with their creativity um, into sort of uh, onto the global stage. Um, they're, they're really supportive of local artisans in Tainan, which is where they're from. Um, and instead of relying on large factories for, for production, they created a community um, from the supply chain to, for, for, to the uh, manufacturing industry in Tainan, which they, you know, the entire um, community is now like family. And recently they've been working with sustainable tech fabrics, namely textiles generated from oyster shells and plastic bottles. Um, and, and they not only retain heat, but are also waterproof. So they're fully functional. So this is sort of like an idea of what, uh, what their work looks like. Very urban gear, um, chic, but fully functional at the same time. The third designer I want to talk about is Peter Wu. Um, he's an emerging Taiwanese designer that's based in Paris, very well known for his clean minimal lines and his exquisite tailoring. He used to work at Le Maire and at Lanvin with Elbaz. And his whole brand advocacy is about reducing waste. So 80% of his sampling and final products are actually made of remaining fabrics from top fashion houses. So not only are consumers buying luxury grade garments, it's also helping the environment by reducing waste. And also um, he is adamant on the fact that uh, his, all of the packaging coming out of his online store are sustainable. And that is my short presentation of what is currently going on in Taiwan in terms of uh, sustainability and about uh, nurturing emerging designers. And I want to pass the baton now to Norman. Hi, Leslie, thank you for that. Thanks for that presentation. Um, so for me today, I'm going to break my presentation to three parts. So firstly is two Singapore designers that I think are really exciting and have been doing great things in Singapore for the last 10 years. And then looking at some young graduates uh, from Singapore that are graduating from design schools this year. And then lastly, innovation in fashion. So uh, let's start the presentation. I mean, just wanted to say to be in vogue really matters. And I think it's these initiatives, Leslie, that you're doing with Taipei Fashion Week. Uh, you know, that we have the power to really uh, present people and issues to the global stage. So thank you for that. And uh, want to share what we're doing in our part of the world. So we move on to the next slide. We will see uh, Singapore favorites. And in particular, on the next slide, there are two designers that I personally love. We have Priscilla Shumagam, as well as Chelsea Scott Blackhall. I'll start off with Priscilla. So on the next slide, you'll see that Priscilla is the founder of the Ong Shumagam brand. Uh, the great thing about Priscilla is, you know, she's taken the Cheong Sam, something that is very, you know, recognizable, but, you know, introduced new silhouettes. And she's now been known for three main things, um, artisanal tailoring, signature use of regional prints and fabrics, as well as her now uh, very famous mid shin cut on her dresses, as well as a broadly cinched uh, waist. So in the center here, you see the 10 year anniversary of what Priscilla has done. And it's kind of her, uh, some of her greatest hits, but uh, shown in some new modern kind of color palettes and uh, textiles. And then on the right, this is her latest resort 2022 collection. Uh, what I love about Priscilla is she really takes that contemporary Asian aesthetic and creates a real modern wardrobe. So she's been super successful here. She's really carved um, a place for herself locally, and she is venturing with new stores uh, in the in UK and Europe in the next coming years. So that's the first designer. 
Second designer is Chelsea Scott Blackhall. Uh, Chelsea started a brand in 2009. So if we move on to the next slide. Yep, thank you. Her brand is called Doton. And she started in 2009 with handmade Japanese denim. And it was really her gateway to tailoring. Um, but she really kind of blew up globally when she dressed Chadwick Boseman uh, for the Black Panther tour. So you see that image on the furthest left. And she created what is now her signature kimono style belted suit. So that really led to different A-listers globally kind of clamoring to wear Doton. And then we see, for example, KJ Apa wearing the salmon pink cashmere two-piece that sold out when he wore it at the Teen Choice Awards a few years ago. And more recently um, at the shang world premiere, we have Sumi Liu wearing the belted kimono suit. And then she's also done custom pieces for Shawn Mendes. So she uh, dresses Shawn Mendes exclusively for his tour. And he's wearing here like this beautiful pin dot cashmere denim cut jacket and uh, ripple silk bamboo shirt. And I mean, this is just a snapshot of some of the different A-list celebrities she's been dressing. She's dressed Angela Bassett and Donald Glover, Ryan Gosling for uh, Jimmy Kimmel Live. And actually the current Tag Heuer campaign features Ryan wearing this beautiful leather Dojin jacket and I'll be contacting Chelsea for how to get my hands on that jacket. Um, so there's are two kind of established designers. I mean, it was really hard to narrow it down to two, but those are two that really uh, have a place in my heart. But what about young graduates? So I wanna spotlight four graduates from different design schools in Singapore. So first we have Jenny Nguyen. She's from the Raffles Design Institute uh, in collaboration with uh, Coventry University. And this collection is called Being Yourself. And as you can see, it's a more is more aesthetic. Um, it's a textual mashup of jacquard, organza, tweed, and wool. And you see this on streamlined trousers, plume blouses, as well as pagoda sleeve coats. And um, there's this kind of grandeur of the Baroque era with the eclectic 80s maximalist kind of vibe. For the next young graduate, we have 21-year-old Rupali partnering with Bawika. So um, they hail from India and they were friends in India and they studied together at La Salle College of the Arts here in Singapore. And this uh, graduate collection, which was a six piece graduate collection was entitled An Other Life. And it was all about having a deep empathy for living things. And you'll see the references to, uh, you know, shapes from the animal kingdom and the idea of fashion as protection in this uncertain times. There's a real kind of couture sensibility with, uh, with the pieces here that we shot for Vogue. And then for our last young designer or young graduate, we have 24 year old Singaporean, uh, Renee Chu from the Nanyang Academy of Fine Arts. So she kind of turned her focus inwards and she really wanted to talk about what does fashion look like post pandemic? So she wanted something that was more romantic and familial. And she looked back at her childhood and uh, Peking opera. She used to go to Peking opera with, with a family. And you can see that in the model wearing this uh, red uh, coat with tulle that's inspired by uh, theater garments. So that was young designers. Um, but what about the idea of sustainability? Um, just in here, I wanted to talk about how we've partnered with Levi's uh, to kind of spotlight that design and sustainability doesn't have to be mutually exclusive. So we work with Justin Chua, another young graduate here. Um, you know, think about Singapore is we're only 50, 56 years young as a country. And it's exciting to see what the young designers are, are saying about fashion. And what we loved about Justin was we gave him all this upcycled or dead stock uh, Levi's denim, and he created this 0307 garment. That's the name of his uh, modular garment, which can be worn as a coat, as well as a dress, uh, both front and back. And actually, we have a video to show you. So let's go to the next slide and play the video. My name is Justin Chua, and I'm 25 years old. The task was to design a dress from the stock Levi's garment. My key reference was the glass in bloom exhibition at Gardens by the Bay. The final garment is a double-faced dress that can be worn on both sides, either as a dress, a coat, or a jacket. I hope the piece I've created upholds the values of upcycling and sustainability. Overall, this has been an opportunity to grow as a fashion designer and truly expand out of my comfort zone. Wonderful, thanks for that. And the great thing is we are taking that garment and doing a bit of a roadshow through different Levi's stores in Singapore with the goal of auctioning that dress off in November with the proceeds going towards the Vogue Singapore Foundation, uh, which has a mandate to support young creators moving forward. So um, we're excited about that project. 
Lastly, innovation in fashion. Um, since we launched Vogue in Singapore uh, a year ago, uh, a passion point for my, of mine has always been the intersection of fashion and technology. And leading that charge is this design duo, uh, Jamela Law and Lionel Lim from Bay Elf Design. So you'll see on the far left, they use 3D uh, designs to create their pieces. And they graduated from LaSalle College of the Arts in 2017. And back then they didn't have 3D courses. And the great thing now is with their, what they've done in, in the local design space in just such a short period of the last four to five years, they are now teaching at LaSalle College of the Arts and teaching 3D design. So that's, that's really cool. Um, the second image is a 3D printed dress from their designs. The third image is uh, one of the garments that was uh, exhibited at the Asian Civilizations Museum here in Singapore. And then lastly, on the furthest right, you see two uh, fractal headpieces that were generated by an AI algorithm. Uh, these headpieces I love. And what we did was if we move to the next slide, there's a little GIF of our September issue. So as all the editors know uh, for Vogue, for the September issue, we were given the theme of new beginnings and the idea of what does new beginnings mean for you? So if we pop over to the next slide, for me, I really wanna talk about, you know, what does fashion look like in the metaverse? And we took these uh, fractal headpieces created by Bayoff Design, partnered them up with an NFT artist, Chad Knight, to create these, um, you know, surreal uh, covers that exist only digitally. And the print cover actually, which I have here, was only, literally just a QR code. So it wasn't really a print cover. It was a, co a, a cover that was a portal to a microsite that showcased the virtual covers. Um, and then we move to the final slide. Where you will see um, some other videos as well. Uh, two other artworks created by Bayoff Design and our digital artist, Chad Knight, showcasing different aspects of Singapore. And in both cases, wearing this AI fractal headpieces that they created on the left, um, some of the buildings in the back are actually buildings in Singapore that are still iconic, but less famous than let's say Gardens by the Bay or Marina Bay Sands. And on the right, it's the artist's impression of what it means to be in Singapore as, as an island nation. So yeah, that's currently a quick snapshot of design and innovation from, some, from Singapore. So thanks for having me, Leslie. Thank you so much, Norman. That was so great. Um, well, now let's hear uh, from Kulawit about Thailand. Hi. Hello. Hi. So for me, I think I, you know, I, I I'm trying to, I'm trying to uh, go back to the the very roots of, of 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 fashion in Thailand. That is to go back to help the uh, local communities with their craft. You know, I see. You know, Norman has mentioned the word uh, innovation, and. Uh, for, for Thailand, I think you know Thai wisdom and the word innovation, it's uh, it's a uh, it's used a lot. And you know, in this day of age, the word innovation is used a lot. And for me, it is best applied when it comes to Thai wisdom, and why you know innovation is important for it. What differentiates knowledge with wisdom is that wisdom comes from experience. Uh, these craftsmen have gone through many years of studying and perfecting their craft. Next slide, please. Beauty of nature. I think you know a lot of a lot of uh, uh, these craftsmen work with what they have and what they what they can grow within their community. So Thailand is it's it's, it's a country known for its uh, breathtaking landscapes, natural resources, and a cultural heritage unlike any other. Next slide, please. These will be some of the numbers on, or, or you know, some of the statistics with the, uh, with the, uh, you know, the number of com local communities in Thailand, the the number of uh, uh, the number they earn, the income per per community, and uh, you know, the thirty five percent to the thirty five point five percent are from the northeastern part of the of the region. And 80% uh, Thai local crafts communities and Thai artisans are women. And uh, doing, I mean, this past, this recent years, we we find we find uh, more sort of uh, retail spaces that are dedicated to all this uh, artisanal work. 
Like for example, in Bangkok alone, three new spaces has erected dedicated specially for these uh, local handcraft products. Next slide, please. Thai wisdom for the wedding, for the well-being of the community. I think Thailand is a country that relies heavily on tourism. And what we have seen during the pandemic is that this reliance has caused severe detriments. Uh, people who make crafts and souvenirs for a living suddenly, you know, they, they saw no demand when borders closed off for tourists. This is why the work we do at Vogue, such as the annual gala is so important. Thailand has an estimated uh, 20,000 communities across various provinces with uh, each specializing in a product that showcases its own style, heritage and storytelling. As most of these artisans lack the necessary platform and support to develop their businesses, Vogue aims to bridge that gap by ensuring a sustainable livelihood through marketing these products internationally. I think it's, uh, it's important to utilize the knowledge we have gathered from various trips abroad, Paris, London, you know, Milan, New York, that we, we go annually through the communities who might not have the access to such thing. I think we, you know, we start to, uh, where we are coming in, in each time we, we do a, a community visit is to ensure they see the, the color swatches that are updated, whether it, you know, they see new colors that they have never thought before or certain patterns or you know, color combinations. Next slide, please. So the story that Vogue aims to share with the world, I think it's, it is important that Thai craft is a, it's of national pride and finds a place in the heart of every Thai. The participation craft makers need, whether it is having of the fundamental, uh, whether it is having more awareness or local supporting by purchasing their products are part of the fundamentals of this sustainability. One of the projects that I certainly am working with, with the team and the Ministry of Culture is a pop-up store that will hopefully allow the work of craft makers to be seen beyond just souvenirs, but as part of the everyday lifestyle choices for everyone. Next uh, slide, please. These are the these are the pictures of calibrations that we have done with uh, international designers. We've been doing it for the past uh, eight years in Thailand. The calibrations we do each year with international brands for Vogue help to create awareness and value for the work of Vivas. And this invite, uh, I think, uh, we have to understand the privilege that comes with the position we hold by ensuring that the international designers we work with and collaborate with start to see the work we do locally. Since I started at Vogue, I've been connecting international designers with local craftsmen to open the possibility of dialogues between these international brands and local silk weavers. It can be an inspiration or providing separate sourcing materials to these international houses. So people will see, will, will, will start to see the value and beauty of Thai silk that we produce and continue to see it as something integral to fashion and fabric internationally and not just souvenirs. As you can see, we'll, we worked with uh, the house of you know, Max Mara, we've worked with Atro, uh, Roger Vivier, Todd has, you know, has collaborated with us from day one. Uh, you know, Diane has, 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 uh, work, has worked with us from, from really from day one and you know, Jimmy Shu. So these designers were provided silk that were produced from local communities and turned them into, uh, you know, they're, they're very beautiful and, and uh, uh, unique design. So yeah, each, each year we, you know, we calibrate with, with all these designers to produce all this beautiful collection. And all the money will be auctioned off at the Vogue Gala. And this money that was, the, the money that, that we, uh, from the auction, therefore, uh, 
were put uh, are put into the uh, the Vogue Fashion Fund, the Vogue Fashion Fund to help nurture young designers uh, in the years to come. Next uh, slide, please. When I when you know when I speak about innovation, I uh, I talk about three key areas of focus. Firstly, how we innovate the business of weavers to cater not to the tourist market as souvenirs, but to appeal to local demands as well. How the aspect of design and creativity of the weavers can be adapted in modern times and continue the preservation of Thai wisdom for the next generation. And most importantly, working with international audiences and local retailers to support the products made and to see them as rare and a special part of our culture. And uh, these are three of the designers we have worked with, you know, over the past, and each have contributed in, you know, each have worked and contributed in, in the modernizing local, local materials. The first brand is uh, VT Thai. I think one of the, you know, one of the great things I love is to work with and it's, it's the work we do with local designers. Over the years, I've been connecting local designers with uh, communities in hopes that uh, each is able to find inspiration in one another and create commerce together. Uh, there are challenges and sometimes putting commitment together, it's difficult as these trips require traveling out of the city, but it is rewarding. For example, VT type, you know, goes to as far as you know, the northeastern region of Thailand where, where uh, communities produce uh, water hyacinth and bamboo husk and weave them into baskets and, and, and bags. What we do at Vogue is we travel with the brand to these uh, communities and show them slides and samples of uh, what, do you, uh, what European markets are doing and therefore they have a, you know they have a better understanding of the market next slide please so their goal at at uh, vt thai is is to uh, the mission is it's from local to global what they what they do is they produce all this uh, all these bags from local materials with our help and uh, through international KOLs market these products abroad. Next slide, please. The citizen of Norway. I think this is a very, very interesting brand simply because he works uh, directly with local communities and with, 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 you know, with the uh, resources that he finds in different regions, he turns them into this funky and uh, uh, interesting furnitures. I think, you know, one of the, uh, one, one of the, you know, one of the privileges uh, that we, we, you know, we have at, at Vogue is it allows us access to knowledge and, uh, you know, and best practices, which we can utilize to support the local communities. And I think that it's, that is so true with this brand because next slide, please, you see all these, uh, uh, you know, really funky craft from locally produced materials. Next slide, please. Renin Renin Project started with us in 2017 and was actually handpicked by me to be uh, in one of our very interesting incubation program where we nurture young designers each year. Each year we picked 10 designers and nurture them and, you know, and, and sort of uh, uh, advise them through their, their businesses. And when Renin Project started, the brand only did upcycling. They, they worked with uh, abandoned uh, uh, denim cloth or, or you know, secondhand vintage jeans and they make them into different designs. But then, you know, with the help of us, of, you know, with, with, with the help of Vogue, he has turned those jeans, in, he has made them into a new fabric by turning those jeans into stripes. 
and have you know all these uh, local weavers weave them weave them into new materials, which I find very very interesting. And these materials are quite sturdy, and they you know they 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 can they make into in, into uh, bags and and and, and uh, duffel bags and you know backpacks. Next slide, please. This is I think this is the the his newest. Uh, collection. I think it's his latest collection where he works. This is, you know, this is uh, during this it's, uh, trial process. These cloth are works uh, actually from bamboo husk. And uh, he had woven, you know, he had them woven into this thinly fine, almost uh, linen like fabric and made them into, you know, beautiful designs. Last slide, please. So, you know, for us, I think, you know, for us to care and fostering hope within local communities is very important. I think craft making is an art form that has gone through years of perfecting with none of this knowledge necessary preserved for the next generation if there is no demand. So whether it is knowing when it is the best time to harvest from nature or caring for silkworms, these years of know-how will diminish if we do not care and foster hope for the communities guiding this Thai wisdom. I think that's it for my uh, slides. Thank you, Kuluid, for such a comprehensive overview. I I'm learning so much as I listen to you <laughs> I, I was you know a bit nervous but you know uh i think i think it's i think it's important for us especially in thailand to look back at our local communities and look back you know at our roots absolutely yeah. absolutely so finally let's hear from sorry about japan okay thank you leslie um from many of japan's leading talents Today, I would like to introduce three designers who speci specialize in developing the sustainable fashion. So the first designer will be Ryunosuke Okazaki. For him, a look is considered to be a piece of art. So each look is only made of one piece. Ryunosuke was born in Hiroshima in 1995, started his own brand when he was still a student in 2018, graduated from Tokyo University of Arts in 2021, where he received a first prize in the graduation exhibition. His first runway show was this past September, where he presented his past collections, which were developed whilst at school and were awards winning ones. The concept of his creation is very much based on prey. I believe that this relates to his roots as he grew up in an environment where Orizuru paper cranes were donated to the atomic bomb victims to pray for peace. Actually, one of his earliest works was made from textile from recycled paper from donated paper cranes. This concept of wearing a prayer's piece became something that continues to inspire his creations. The picture on the right and in the middle is called Jomon Jomon and were inspired by the Jomon pottery, the oldest pottery in Japan. The, jo the Jomon period spans a long time period of time, approximately 10,000 years, during which time mankind lived under the threat of nature. Junoski believes that this awe of nature, this hope for its blessings, this wish for the very survival of mankind is embodied in the shape of his, uh, earthenware. The picture on the left is called Nature's Contours, which is taken from the perspective of nature worship, coexisting with petal-like shapes, insect-like colors, and marine life. All of these looks were made from excess textile. The next designer is Yui Manakasato. He was born in 1985 and found, founded his label in 2009. He first presented, 
high for the collection in Paris. Paris Haute Couture Fashion Week as official guest designer in 2016. He graduated from the Royal Academy of Fine Arts Antwerp, where he earned multiple awards in Europe for his graduate collection. I feel that his uniqueness is due to the material that he develops with a company called Spybar. It is a synthetic protein fabric and is called Brute Protein, which returns to the soil. His approach to sustainable fashion has come uh, that comes from the latest science and technology is truly impressive to me. This season, he continued to advance this technology to the next level. He has incorporated the whale's voice into the textile. This is called the bio smoking pattern, a special technique Yuima uses to make his textile based on the sound of the whale's voice. The picture on the right, you will see the graphic of the whale printed on the leather, which is made of multiple layers of UV inkjet. What is remarkable of this collection is that he reduced the use of virgin materials as low as possible, and 30% of the entire collection is upcycled or repaired material, while the other materials are all natural, leaving a low impact on the environment. And many of the looks resembles kimonos, the Japanese traditional clothes, which covers all genders, body shapes, and ages. And the last designer I would like to introduce to you is Mikageshin, which I'm wearing one of her pieces today. She was born in 1991, graduated from Parsons School of Art and Design. She then established her namesake brand in New York City in 2019. In uh, February 2020, Mikage held a show in Paris Fashion Week and was selected as part of the Wants to Watch program. In September 2020, she moved her base in Japan. Then in September 2021, she showed her latest collection during Tokyo Fashion Week. Mikage's constructive and gentle designs paired with her philosophical worldview which respect social issues and diversity have been recognized as new talents that have never seen before in Japanese brands. She clearly argues against gender discrimination and respects diversity for social stance of sincerely addressing environmental and social issues such as SDGs is truly really admirable which is increasingly becoming a new standard among the new generation's designers. Mikage has proposed new architectural layers with a genderless narrative aesthetic. The brand aims to create gender-fluid, ageless, and borderless designs. In fact, there's many male customers who come to buy skirts in her store. I also would like to point out that from her first collection, the brand started donating excess textiles to Fab Scrap, a charitable and non-profitable organization to promote, to promote reuse and recycling fabric. Also, uh, Fab Scrap supports women entrepreneurs, entrepreneurs. In addition to that, the brand is conscious to avoid excess, excessive production and packaging. I feel that she's becoming the future, uh, a voice of the diversity of Japanese fashion. So for all of these three designers that I just introduced to you have a bold vision, and I strongly believe that they will represent the future of Japanese fashion. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sari. Um, thank thank you. you, everyone. So, so, you know, after I think all of our presentations, it's very clear that there are very, um, I think, distinct characteristics from each of our territories in terms of how the young designers are seeing the future. But I, I, I want to start off the discussion by asking a question, which I think maybe Kulawit has already answered in his presentation, but, but I'm curious to know what you feel like is the competitive advantage for your respective territories in terms of, you know, fashion or, or the industry itself. Me? Sure. 
Well, I, any, any of you, um, I think for me, like I, I mentioned that I feel like the, the innovation in our textile industries are um, really allowing for our young designers to be experimental and sort of, and I also feel like, um, you know, when I, when I see the designs coming from your territories, of course, the sources of inspiration, say, you know, from, from Japan, they're all, it's, it's very di different from the sources of inspiration from Thailand or from Singapore. And I think for us, it's really so much about practical everyday wear. I think for, for Thailand, we see a new breed of young designers that are, you know, that are very interested in handicraft. And, they, yeah. you know, they are moving back and they're looking into their local communities. They, you know, they, they do all these uh, uh, visits in, in, little, in little villages. They work with, you know, weavers. They have their own techniques. They bring with them their own, they bring with, with them their own knowledge of fashion. And, you know, it's the collaboration between the old and the new that I find very, very interesting. And that, you know, and that will differentiate Thai fashion from the rest of, of you know, territory. Right, no, I think that's incredible. I think that's really, you know, something we should really all encourage our younger designers to look into. Um, how about Singapore, Norman, what do you think? Yeah, I mean, the thing about Singapore, it's such a young country, but I think, I mean, to be a designer in Singapore, is so brave, I personally feel, because there are so many barriers to, to young designers, both structurally and uh, culturally. Structurally, we're a population of 5 million, so you can't do like a thousand run of you know, dresses. You don't have the benefits of economies of scale. You don't even have the benefit of manufacturing locally. I mean, Ford in Thailand has amazing craft, right, at your disposal, and we're super, um, I'm always so enthused by what is happening in Thailand. And culturally, unfortunately, I think, the people that buy fashion here um, are still gravitating towards the big luxury brands, but it is starting to change. And I think for Singapore being a hub for our part of the world, that idea of technology and innovation keeps coming back. And I think there's some really interesting startups actually that have been experimenting with digital fashion, um, the likes of Republic uh, that create garments purely virtually as well. So that's quite interesting and something that we're keeping an eye on. And what about Japan for you, sorry? Well, I think um, in Japan, we had like a kimono culture until for, for uh, I think, uh, the early 20, 20th century. So the history of the Western clothes is very short, I would say. So I think they have the freedom of creation. They don't have something that, you know, the structure of the Western clothes. So I think uh, they have a freedom of creation. That's why I see those interesting um, fashion designs in, in the market. How do you think that your respective markets are supporting local designers when it comes to, let's, you know, we were sort of talking about in terms of um, creative output, but what about distribution? Like how, how are your respective markets supporting these young or even just local designers in terms of distribution, you know, because ultimately, you know, they have to make a living. Mm -hmm. So I'm just curious in terms of how, you know, how locally you're supporting that. In, in Thailand, we have a program, and I'm not sure if it's, uh, if you have, if you have that same program in, in, in your part of the, of, of, you know, of the world, we have what we call the, the Vocals Onyx program which initially is, you know, the uh, incubation program that we, uh, we help young designers, not just with design, but, you know, with the uh, business, with the knowledge of business. So each year we handpicked 10 design, 10 local designers, and uh, we put them into a, you know, a program, we teach them how to, uh, to uh, make, uh, you know, the business, how to run a really, uh, uh, you know, fashion business. We have, we have, you know, speakers from marketing, from, you know, from, from Club 21, from, you know, merchandising, from PRs, uh, and myself to, to, you know, to sort of tutor them on, on, you know, what they expect the, you know, what, re what the real world expect from them. Right. That's incredible. I need to talk to you offline about this. <laughs> <laughs> and, and the, the money we get from the Vogue Gala auction goes into the Vogue Fashion Fund that helps fund these young designers. 
Okay. So it's a full so it's 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 a full cycle at, at you know in, in Thailand. Wow. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> Very interesting. Right. A lot we I mean, can learn from this. But how about like the market in general? You know, are they are they? You know, I, I guess Kilowin, you talked about how you know even with these artisans and craftsmen, you know, Thailand is taking initiative and in putting them in retail stores. Yeah. So um, are there sort of these initiatives happening in Singapore or in Japan? For sure. I mean, we've kind of looked at, around at our, our other Vogue partners and kind of learned from them. And we have a similar thing called the Vogue um, Innovation Prize, where, where we're rewarding people that are showing innovation in the creative industry. So it doesn't have to be purely fashion design. It could be, you know, things to do with um, upcycling it has it could be like avatar creation and just kind of the whole life cycle of uh, creativity and uh, we've also partnered with the textile and fashion federation and they have set up a store on orchard road and for anyone that's visited singapore you know orchard road is the main shopping district and rents are super yeah. high so it's great they've actually got a space on orchard road actually opposite h&m where right. they have the design center so they get to showcase all the designers that working with you know, partners like Vogue that we want to spotlight when tourists and visitors want to buy local. So I think that's a great initiative by the local um, textile federation. And then on the creativity side as well, um, you know, similar to what you guys have in your own uh, countries is the program of Vogue Talent Prize. We're always looking for new photographers, stylists, you know, 3D animators, whatever it is to tell really exciting stories in the pages of Vogue. That's great. I think um, along, along similar lines, we do have, um, a pop-up retail space mm -hmm. for all of these designers that we're showcasing during Taipei Fashion Week. You know, I, I just think it's so important for the public to be able to go in and, and touch it and feel it and actually see these clothing exactly. you know, in person because you know it's one thing showcasing them on a runway, but it's another mm -hmm. thing having them sort of on the streets. I think that's a different level of success for a lot of a lot of designers. Yeah. So no, that's definitely, I mean, we're hoping that some of these pop-up venues can become permanent to yeah. share our designers. And, and I can share with you, you know, the, the pop-up that we do each year, we call it Vogue Shop. Mm -hmm. And it, it, you know, it showcases all these, you know, handcraft products from different regions and with, with the funding of, from, the, uh, from the government. So each year we do that. And, you know, it's really interesting what they come up with. How about in how about in Japan? I, I know that Japan also does sort of like a big shopping event annually. Yeah, I mean I have to say the market is quite mature in Japan. So Vogue itself, it we don't do any shops or <laughs> unfortunately, but you, if you go to I mean stores or you know department stores, it's, they they already have some spaces that we don't need to help probably. But yeah, it's, um, I think it's something that we can consider to develop in the future. But is it, um, yeah, because I do know that in Japan, there are a lot of um, local designers who are already in department stores. They have, yeah. or they have their standalone stores. So it's really, so the, the public uh, yeah. are actually very much used to buying local brands. Yeah. Is that right? Okay. Yeah, that's pretty incredible, I think. Mm -hmm you know, the, in terms of, of the development. So we have a few questions. Uh, we have a few, a little bit of time for a few questions from the audience. I have a list here and I, I, I was surveying the list and I realized that they're really taking advantage of all of us editors being online at the same time. So a lot of the questions are centered around how can one become a great editor? Oh, wow. <laughs> wow. I, mean, I think Norman, Norman, you should answer that. <laughs> Why me? Oh my God. I mean, I, you're, I, you're, the, I you're the baby. Quickly. You're the baby. What, what, is it, what does it take? What does it take? And uh, Why don't I answer you... from what I think you guys are doing really well, you know, because I'm like such a baby to the team. I'm a baby um, to the team. You <laughs> <laughs> I think a good editor, just looking at the people on screen today, um, you guys have great discipline. 
great vision of what you want to create for your title, what you want to say about fashion. There's so much happening in fashion, right? So how do you create that and have a particular point of view? Um, there's a lot of discipline because it, it's, it's a lot of hard work and also making sure that, I mean, end of the day, you need to have taste. Do you know what I mean? Like you need to, uh, Vogue is only as good as the things that you exclude, not just the things that you include. And I think increasingly understanding the platforms for communication and being very agile, if anything, and this applies beyond Vogue, the last two years has taught us about the need to constantly assess and look for new opportunities. How can we pivot and change and speak to our audiences in such, you know, uh, difficult times? I think what you just said about, you know, it's as important what we include or what we exclude as yeah. it is important what we include. I think that's incredible. I, I wish I'd written that down. I'm going to have to engrave that in my brain because you know <laughs> our real job is editing. Yeah. Uh, and sort of editing to the Vogue standards, I think. Yes. But but in my opinion, I also feel like a lot of uh, sort of, um, I guess, younger kids, they would aspire, aspire to become editors or fashion editors, um, and they would ask what it takes. And, and, and what I wanna say is that, you know, fashion is culture. So to be able to be a, be a fashion editor, or even just a good stylist, it's not just about your knowledge in fashion or fashion history, it's about, your knowledge for culture and the arts as a whole, because all of that is going to help you with your aesthetics, with building taste to Norman's point. Mm -hmm. um, and to really, you know, from fine arts to, to architecture or even to literature, to music, to, uh, to social happenings, to history and all of that. I think all of that sort of comes together to shape you as an individual to contribute to this sort of um, to the social conversation, because I feel like as much as Vogue is an advocate for fashion right now in this day and age is so much more of an advocate for culture. Yeah, so that's sort of my, my advice. Also, I like to also add that fashion is also business. So do not forget yeah. that, you know, publication, pub, publishing is business, you know, without business, we cannot go on, we cannot publish magazine. So, you know, you have to understand and balance between what you like to photograph, what you like to, you know, to put in, in, in the magazine and our investors. I think that's also very important. Thank you so much for, for uh, bringing out the practical side of what we go through every day. It's not just all romantic and I No, no, it, it's never about that. I mean, no, we that, have to balance right? a lot of things, yes, right? Yes. All the time. I think it's important to communicate communicate within the within the industry and also to know really what's going on, not just to have like an, an input that you can see only see but you just talk to the people and know what's going on and also know what you want to express is important i guess well thank you you know i'm gonna end our conversation with one last question which i think is a very substantial one um so uh, someone from the audience asked if we think that there is a good example of uh, sustainable fashion right now. Good example. Yeah. I think well, we claim that we're doing so much. <laughs> <laughs> to a certain degree, there is. And, you know, I'm really happy to see a lot of designers, especially in Thailand, again, towards and they are, they are, they're sort of practicing and the, you know, and the principle in, in building their, the brand on sustainability, on, you know, on, you know, zero waste. And I think that that's, it's not, it's not, it's not really a trend really, but it's, you see that it's a, a sort of a new wave of designers that are taking all these into consideration and not just, you know, making collection. Yeah. Well, I guess I should rephrase the, the question a little bit. It, it's not like a good example. Like we have to pick one thing that, has been done really well, but rather maybe good practices that are, I guess, um, helping us progress. Yeah, I think that's a that's a good way of thinking about it because there are a lot of brands that kind of greenwash. You know, they say that they're sustainable and they're just buying carbon offsets, but what is that really doing 
mm-hmm. you know, how are you actually changing your production or your distribution or your design to be more sustainable. Um, there is a company I want to kind of do a shout out to. It's New Cycle, NU Cycle, and they um, neutralize your waste impact. They look at your brand and see how much waste you produce in a year and try to find organizations that you can then invest in and help add into your supply chain to actually reduce your waste impact. So do check them out. I think they're doing a great job and some brands have already started using them to have some tangible impact when it comes to uh, having less waste in the world when it comes to fashion. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I, I feel like, you know, recently there are major, major brands sort of advocating and really, you know, in practice, pushing the idea of, producing less and less waste in that they're willing to recycle their own products. You know, they're welcoming consumers to return the old garments or products in exchange for something new or in in exchange for some kind of initiative so they can take the old uh, materials and upcycling and upcycle them into something new. I, I think that it's less about what they say, but really more about what they do. But although I have to say that when large corporations make manifestos about not, not using fur or you know prohibiting certain kinds of business practices, it still sends a big statement to the world in terms of you know where the industry is going. So I still appreciate it. However long the process may take, I feel like with these yes. statements being thrown out, at least we understand what the priorities are. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, at least it's on the radar. Yes, yes. exactly. Yes. It's in the conversation now. Yes. So, I mean, it's a, that's a, you know, it's a dialogue between. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. Well, thank you guys so much. It was just yeah. such a pleasure and so nice. I don't think that the four of us has really ever gotten together to have a conversation. There's so much for us to talk about offline yeah. in terms yeah. of how we can push this forward. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you for having us. It was a thank pleasure. Thank you for having us. And good to see you. Good to see, good to see you, Norman. Good to see you, Sauri. Good to see you, Ford. Good to see you, Norman. Thank you, Leslie. Bye. Bye.